My absolute favorite subject, something I studied in a lot of depth for many years, uh, and mostly because it, it was one of those kind of synchronistic things where the thread of conceptual continuity ran from my childhood all the way um, through adulthood. Let me, let me get my microphone. Apologize, my computer's in the shop, so um, I'm not really accustomed to setting all this stuff up uh, as I was before. So let's see if I can check. Okay, it looks like looks like we're good. So the audio should have just improved a little bit. So. Uh, this fascination for me actually started as a child, and mostly because I was surrounded by fundamentalist Christians in the Deep South, and I noticed that this religion of theirs seemed to um, inspire a lot of bigotry. Uh, hello, Rebecca. Uh, a lot of um, oppression. Uh, I would get like jumped and beat up uh, uh, by groups of Christians. Um, they would use, even as teenagers, they would use the fact that they were going to be saved uh, as an excuse for doing evil things because they felt that if they had been saved by Jesus um, that they could do anything they wanted and then it doesn't matter because nothing's going to happen to them. Uh, so, you know, I, I didn't understand even as like a six-year-old, I guess, how it was that people didn't realize that if they were born in the southern United States, for example, uh, they were fundamentalist Christian and if people are born in India... They're likely to be Hindu. And, and so I didn't understand why they didn't understand why they had this religion. And that would allow them to transcend it. You know what I mean? Like, it's just cultural baggage. I, and I, I didn't get it. Uh, and so the actual catalyst for this for me was an argument with a little girl in second grade. Um, uh, she, she said something about Jesus. And I said, well, I, I don't, I'm not Christian. And she said, what? Uh, then you're a devil worshiper. And I was like, well... No, I don't believe in the whole thing, so I can't worship part of it. I don't worship any of it. Um, the devil's part of it. And she said, well, no, my daddy said that if you're not Christian, then you're a devil worshiper. And so uh, here I am, um, you know, <laughs> 42 years old, all these years later, Baphomet behind me. Um, and it's 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 really not that simple. But uh, so... The next thing that happened is that I was at the mall and I found Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible and I had started going to the Salvation Army Church for poor disadvantaged children um, because they took us to King's Dominion and stuff that our parents couldn't afford. And I started bringing this copy of the Satanic Bible to church with me to read. Um, and of course, Satan has absolutely nothing to do with Lucifer. And in fact, Lucifer has nothing to do with anything really, as we will see in a moment when we consider the fact that there's actually no Lucifer in the original Bible. Uh, the word in Hebrew is Hillel, uh, which is, it could mean to howl. So it's, it's either saying howl, son of the morning. It's a verb, basically. It's not even a name. Uh, or shine, shine day star. It's not even morning star in the original Hebrew. It's day star. Uh, so, um, so I mean, that that's, you know, just, I, I'm just kind of, I wanted to give a basic idea of how long I have been uh, contemplating this myth. And eventually it would lead to an understanding of uh, the Gnostics and how they uh, perceived that the serpent in the Garden of Eden was actually the one that was telling the truth and was therefore good. Um, and I noticed that as well. Uh, and I also noticed that, uh, the, the preacher would stand in the pulpit and, and tell people this story that was the opposite of what actually happened in the book. And all of the sheep in the audience would believe this story. That's the opposite of what's written in the book. Right. Um, and so a lot of people, even though not even in the Bible is there any association between the serpent in, e in Eden and Lucifer, uh, it's just kind of, it's like a cultural or um, I don't know what to call it. It's just like this 
thing that kind of uh, a oral tradition almost that has grown uh, to be associated with um, the serpent. And I think this happened a long, long time ago. The church probably did this a long time ago. But as the Gnostics observed, the serpent was telling the truth. And so many people uh, make the, the correlation between that serpent and Lucifer, right? And so um, most Luciferians uh, actually see Lucifer, uh, and I think rightly so, as the impulse to um, the impulse to attain divine knowledge for oneself of one's own accord, right? Partly. Um, and I, I think it's also worth noting that in the mystical traditions that I've studied, uh, it seems very likely that uh, the, the serpent um, in the Garden of Eden, what was demonized in that story was consciousness itself uh, and, and the, uh, the impulse to expand our consciousness and to gather more knowledge. You know, this idea that the, the, the fruit of this forbidden plant was actually some kind of psychedelic. Uh, I, you know, I think, of course it was. Uh, and so I don't, I, don't, I don't want to get too um, ahead of ourselves here. But um, the basic gist of it is that, you know, Lucifer, in my mind, is not actually an angel. It's not a person. Uh, it's very difficult uh, for me to, to even perceive or imagine what it would be that people who believe in uh, Lucifer as an actual being, what they're imagining, and that this individual is somehow, you know, giving his attention to spirituality individual people one at a time, or is it supposed to be omniscient like God or, you know, what, what even does that mean? Um, does it walk around? Does it breed? You know, I mean, it's just, I think this, this concept of, uh, these beings in this sense is very antiquated and naive. Uh, and I think that, you know, when we are talking about Lucifer in the sense of, this spirit of rebellion, uh, the spirit of, um, of nonconformity, of recognition of individual sovereignty, um, of, of the divine sovereignty, even of the individual will, um, you know, this makes sense. And when, when I think of a spirit, uh, that's where my, my mind goes, um, to maybe an archetype or, a, a um, a certain frequency of consciousness, uh, but not, not really an individual person. Um, but I, I promise to tell you guys some things that are passed down amongst initiates. And I, I will give you a story that will help you to understand the mystical. Sorry about that guys. It's storming here. And so the internet's cutting in and out a little bit. I'll try to keep going. Um, but if it becomes impossible, obviously it's impossible. Um, okay, so I was about to, to explain this sort of Gnostic mystical uh, interpretation of the Lucifer myth. And this is really, uh, yeah, but I'm back, right? Uh, this is really the essence of the thing. And, and I, I think what I'm about to tell you is, is really, really important. And it is something that is kind of ubiquitous. There, this idea is definitely present in the Hindu tradition, um, Gnostics, uh, the tribe of Judea had a version of it. Uh, and it seems like just about anyone that meditates long enough on this comes to the same sort of conclusion, right? That there was in the beginning, there was nothing. Uh, and this nothing is beyond human conception. Um, and so it suddenly, for whatever reason, you know, there are mysteries that no one uh, should ever lay claim to having an answer for. Um, and maybe this is one of them. But for some reason, it became conscious. It had this awareness. In Hebrew, you would say, uh, is the word that rushed forth, the logos, this vibration, right? And so um, in, in the original Hebrew, well, it's not Hebrew, actually. That's, that's some misinformation. I'm still working on... Um, I definitely appreciate the support, man. Um, we definitely, definitely appreciate support. 
so I should back up and, and mention in case you're unfamiliar that in the original myth of Lucifer, and I'm not sure where this comes from because it's not a Hebrew myth, uh, but I was actually told this in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, the Stella Matatina, the same uh, lineage that um, Israel Regerty was uh, a member of. Um, so, you know, it has some stake to legitimacy because of that. Um, and so what they told me is that Lucifer was the highest angel in the court of the king, God. And he had a harp in his chest with no strings that played telepathically directly into um, the mind of God back. I'm not sure what that's a reference to. So, um, so now reentering our sort of creation story, uh, we had this nothing and then this consciousness sort of appears and the nature of it is vibratory it compels the chaotic energy in the primordial soup to order uh, via vibration. And because of the wave, right, the symmetry of the wave, that is how we have order. Um, on a slightly separate subject, watch out for my video on E8 and uh, the leech, um, oh, what is it called? It's a, it's a higher dimensional object that I think is where we get this symmetry from. Um, and it's called the leech something. But E8 and the leech, whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> um, so, okay, so this vibration, this idea of Lucifer as the court musician, I think that's what this is a metaphor for. Lucifer is a metaphor for process. It's not an angel. It's not a being. It's a, it's a way to talk about these processes. And there was a Pope, actually, I can't remember which one, but he said, you know, the people need the truth cloaked in myth. And I think that these sort of fairy tale versions, these children's story uh, uh, level uh, allegories uh, that have served us up to a certain point. Uh, but I think with just a little bit of contemplation, it's actually not that difficult to um, to get to the center of this metaphysical Tootsie Roll or Tootsie Pop, <laughs> you know, it's just a couple of licks really, and maybe a chomp and you're there. Uh, so, so, and the other aspect of this that relates to Lucifer is that Lucifer in Latin means light bearer, right? So, you know, what bears the light? Stars. And that is a whole nother subject. The idea that the, what, what fallen angels actually are, are stars. They're sentient beings. They project their consciousness onto planets that can sustain life. This is a whole nother trip. Um, and it's, it's something that, you know, is, it exists in many different traditions in one form or another. Uh, so that's one interpretation, the sun itself, right? Um, and, also, you know, Aleister Crowley, the solar phallic, Iwas was the solar phallic Lucifer, uh, a solar angel. He also referred to his holy guardian angel as a solar angel. And I would say it's, it's extremely obvious that our consciousness does indeed come to us on the rays of the light um, by whatever mechanism. Uh, so all of our holy guardian angels on this planet would be the same sentient being, the sun, and therefore whatever name it has would be the universal name for all of our holy guardian angels. Uh, if, if, if you're going to stick to this sort of uh, ontological um, position, I guess. Um, so the other thing that bears the light is matter, any surface, right, uh, it, that's illuminated by the light. Um, and of course, you know, we have this concept in some uh, schools of Gnosticism that matter is literally the devil, Okay, so, you know, we have to, I just wanted to connect those things, the idea of vibration and the idea of light, because it was this immaterial spark that was the physical manifestation of the awareness of, of, of the creator or deity or universal mind or Lucifer or whatever you want to call it. And so before in eternity, we had nothingness, just this absolute nothing. And so the idea that Lucifer fell because of rebelling against God is another childlike simplification. Uh, because what we're actually saying is that in perfection for all of eternity, right, 
you have no lines, you have no movement, you have no desire, you have no time, you have no will, there's no change. There is nothing but eternal nothingness. And as soon as something is moving, as soon as there is a desire, as soon as there's a shadow, as soon as there's a line, right? We no longer have this nothingness, this perfection. And that is what the rebellion against God actually was. It wasn't like this, fuck you, dad, I'm taking the car keys and descending down to, into the realm of matter or whatever. You know, that's not, um, that's just not realistic. You know, if we take our heads out of the fairy tale, uh, you know, realm, this, this sort of childlike religious superstitious kind of modality and actually look for the metaphysics that lie behind this stuff you know we actually start to get something coherent that we actually know is you know the process um we we call it the singularity or the big bang you know but it was this sudden i am and the rushing forth of the vibrations that uh, imposed order onto the chaotic energy uh through means of symmetry you know, um, and so Lucifer is the light bearer, that spark, the electromagnetic wave. Uh, I don't think in those terms, though, all of those names and stuff are just garbage that people have come up with to describe things. Uh, I, I don't, I don't believe any of it. They're, they're not, I don't think of them as beings. This is just different. Um, the way that I think about the different Hebrew names of God is that consciousness is like an infinite spectrum, right? And so you have um, divisions, uh, just like a sundial or the zodiac is an excellent way to think about it. And so the central, um, pure, uh, you know, what some people call the spiritual sun or the source is sort of sitting in the middle of this and emanating in different directions around this radial, right? And so, say, right here, you have the Promethean, Luciferian, uh, that, that, uh, that desire to awaken your fellow man, to, uh, to dispel the illusion of religion and culture, and to remind them of divine truth, right? So that would be that archetype of consciousness. And then going around the dial, you have other types of consciousness. And in the physical world, we designate those by the signs of the zodiac, um, so I think that all of these different Hebrew names of God that, that you find throughout mysticism, uh, and this is something that Aleister Crowley would have said, you know, most of the great occultists did not resolutely believe with any kind of conviction that spirits were actually spirits in, in the sense that they had their own objective existence. Um, and so you're asking about Yaza, Yaza Boldoat and all of this stuff. It's just like the Shekinah is like the feminine... Uh, aspect of this consciousness that we refer to as God. It's this healing feminine emotion sort of modality of consciousness. And then, you know, we have all of these different, uh, you know, Elohim is a, a feminine and masculine mode of this uh, consciousness. And then, you know, you have a whole bunch of other names. Um, yeah, and Adonai, Adonai, which just means Lord in general. Uh, and then, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of them. And then it, it, it can actually help us to use these names. They're not just there because, um, just because when you are trying to come to terms with the infinite, uh, having some way to compartmentalize uh, this, this huge spectrum of ideas and modalities of consciousness and all of this stuff, right? It's like a filing cabinet. And so, you know, in like ritual magic practice, you'll have a direction that's associated with an archangel and a God name and a metal or, or, uh, you know, an element and, uh, an emotion, um, or emotions in general and an air and intellect. And you know what I mean? So it allows us to make concrete uh, symbols that have, you know, meaning packed into them, uh, but we can reduce it all down to a single name so long as we have some basic awareness of, uh, of you know, what all these associations are. And so, you know, they're very powerful tools to have all of these different names, but I think that a lot of us outside of, you know, the mysteries have kind of lost touch with the, what the purpose of all of these different names 
uh, are. And we have become sort of indoctrinated into these superstitious fairy tale versions of religion so that even when we think we have stepped out of it, we've just stepped into another version of it. And so you have to be very careful about, you know, going from one box into another box instead of just getting out of all the boxes. You don't want to go, you know, across the hall, back and forth across the hall. You want to get up on the roof so you can look down on the situation and see it all, right? <laughs> uh, mushrooms are great for that. So... Um, So, okay, so backing up a little bit, we did talk about how, you know, this nothingness became conscious and the immaterial spark that was the light, uh, which creates consciousness. Um, it was that process uh, that created, uh, that caused the descent into matter. So again, I think that's just a metaphor for, it's not being kicked out of heaven. It's that this energy uh, through a process of reflection and replication, uh, cre started creating more and more complicated geometries, right? Things started to cool down and crystallize. And so you had planets and, you know, I mean, you guys went to school, I'm sure. You know the rest of the story. Uh, and so um, the various uh, suns... Um, as intelligences, this is something that I also find really interesting. And I don't know that it, it is really saying that they're like conscious themselves, but um, the, the way that I think about sentient beings, for example, if you consider the fact that, you know, physics tells us that the universe is just energy at the end of the day, right? But what does that actually mean? There are four uh, major fields, just as there are four um, four elements and the fifth being spirit. Uh, what I think that also is kind of a metaphor for, because remember, this is all reflective. So the, the, what we call spiritual or energetic is a reflection of the physical and vice versa. Uh, and so, you know, this idea that you can only learn about these things from going internally, I think is incorrect. It's only half the story. You have to learn to balance, uh, external perception and internal perception. One or the other isn't going to give you the whole story. Um, and so it's the interaction of these uh, four fields that generates the fifth, the quintessence, the philosopher's stone, the universal consciousness. And so where we have like humans that are, you know, pretty high on the uh, scale of consciousness, at least relative to a lot of the things around us. Although I'm increasingly not confident of that. I've seen animals doing some, I watched a leopard kill a baby, a, a monkey that had a baby with it. And then it played with the baby monkey and then brought gently the baby monkey back to the troop. Like what, what is that? You know? And, and that's not typical for sure. I mean, Normally a leopard would just eat them both, but it, it happened. And the leopard took the baby monkey back. And um, so anyways, uh, I, I don't want to get too, too off the subject with the monkey and the leopard there. But the point is that I see um, consciousness, our individual units of consciousness as like vectors of convergence of EMFs, uh, electromagnetic waves, um, or these four fields. And that's what physicists say as well, that what we think of as particles aren't actually particles. They're more like bunched up um, spots on this fabric of uh, fields, right? And so a sun is an extremely dense vector of convergence for these fields, right? And so the idea that it would be like super conscious and emanating enough consciousness on the rays of its light to, uh, you know, to, to create a story like this on a planet is um, pretty, pretty, it's reasonable, right? So um, this is the, you know, uh, when I was saying that there is a lot of depth that lies behind the Lucifer myth, I was not kidding. It's, it, and it's, it's quite extraordinary. Um, and then, you know, 
this this idea of um, this the sacrifice of Christ, right? Uh, this is pretty interesting as well. And a lot of people believe that uh, Christ and Lucifer were actually the same being. Um, and you know, just for the record, I'm of the opinion that neither of them existed at all, uh, <laughs> and especially Jesus. Um, but it actually, if you read the Bible as an adept, it's quite clear that the story is depicting the one that they call Jesus Christ as deliberately depicting him as the, the false prophet that everyone was warned about. Like, look out for this guy. Satan comes as an angel of light. Here comes Jesus. Hi, God has sent me and I am the light. Wait, weren't we just warned about this very thing? Like, like 45 pages back, like, um, So, uh, okay, but so this idea, right, that God is nothing, uh, it's actually, um, it's, you know, I have a Masonic, old Masonic book over there, Albert Pike's Mortals and Dogma, um, and at one point he takes on, like, he's speaking as if he's God, uh, and he says, the Phoenicians thought me light, but I am nothing, nothing in all caps, you know, and uh, this is something that is been with me for quite some time. Also, a really good way to try to start wrapping your head about around this is Aleister Crowley's Book of Lies, so falsely called um, The Wanderings of the One Thought of Frater Perturabo, uh, who's, um, who in itself is untrue. It's a really long title, um, but you probably know the book. But anyways, this nothing, right? So the idea is that what we think of as God, this 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 eternal nothingness, um, and since the laws of the universe are that uh, everything is sustained by the existence of its antinomy, right? Its contradiction is what is creating it. So this nothing is essential to sustaining the existence of the all. Um, and so, but it has no consciousness itself. So it has sacrificed its eternal life, its consciousness, its awareness in order to sustain all of creation and existence, um, so I think even in that, the, the, the Christian aspect of that, uh, myth, cause the Bible was actually written by adepts. If you have studied the mysteries, if you've taken initiation and, and then you read the Bible, there's a whole lot of stuff in there that people would never have a chance of understanding otherwise references to gematria and other kind of spiritual sciences that would be totally lost on the profane, um, and I, I think that's one of them, you know, these sort of grand metaphors that are actually speaking about the uh, fundamental processes that created the universe and that sustained the universe and all these great metaphysical truths. Uh, but they were sort of wrapped up in a story. Um, speaking of that, uh, there's this conspiracy theory uh, that, you know, Luciferians rule the world. And um, I think it's, it's important that we address that. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's not true. Um, for one thing, if uh, Hillary Clinton was Luciferian, she would be like in shape and she would, she wouldn't dress so frumpy. You know what I mean? Like that no self-respecting Luciferian or Satanist would look like that. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I'm kind of being facetious here. Oh well, I can explain the uh, the 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 inverted pentagram and the the upright pentagram if you like. Um, it's actually interesting because the inverted pentagram does not have anything to do with evil. Uh, it's just another depiction of process. It is the uh, descent of this light into matter, and then when it's pointed the way with the with the point up, it's the redintegration of matter back into spirit or light. Um, so both pentagrams are just glyphs of process. There is no evil intention. Um, the evil interpretation of it comes from the fact that, you know, Gnostics and others have considered the world of matter to be evil, just abjectly evil. And so if you consider being alive and being part of the material universe uh, as being evil, then the inverted pentagram, I guess, would be a symbol of evil if you think that be being alive and being in the material realm is evil. Um, but otherwise, it's just a symbol for process. Uh, but we were talking about the conspiracy of the Luciferians and whatnot, and one of the many reasons why it's just kind of silly and what actually caused it, right? 
because truth is in everything. Uh, everything that exists is in the sense of reflection and replication of this one process uh, that, that occurred in the beginning, right? Just like when a cell divides, you can think of like when that nothingness was whole and then it split because of this thought, you know, that two equals zero of Aleister Crowley um, or zero equals two, because that's what happened. It went from nothing to two, from nothing to duality. The one doesn't actually exist because if, if you have empty space and an object, you have two things. So the paradox that is also uh, inextricably intertwined with all of creation began at the very beginning because the only possible way to have one is to have none, right? You have to have uh, nothing because as soon as you have space and a thing, you have two things. And that's also why we go from zero to two. Um, but one of the reasons or the one of the bits of evidence I'll give for how mainstream spirituality, whether it's Christianity or, you know, any other belief system like that dogmatic doctrinal belief system, um, I have always said that they actually preclude uh, experience, spiritual experience, right? They discourage it, which is like the ultimate blasphemy to create a spiritual system um, that is designed to preclude spiritual experience, right? That's what they're there for. That's how they're used. That's what they do. Um, by the way, do me a favor and hit the like button, share, subscribe, support us on Patreon. You find in the description, PayPal, Zelle, and uh, what is that thing? A, a wallet, cryptocurrency wallet address, and also Cash App. Um, we really do appreciate your support because we're demonetized for talking about stuff like this, I guess. Um, so if you like the message, uh, please support us because we get nothing from YouTube. Um, so uh, here's the thing about that. A lot of the stories that reflect uh, this Lucifer myth, right? Like the, the Grateful Dead, um, who, by the way, tell the story of the um, Lucifer with the harp uh, with no strings in his chest uh, and how the consciousness comes on the rays of gold in the song Ripple. Um, and how we are all that consciousness that's emanating from the sun. It's um, if my words did glow with the gold of sunshine. And remember that gold is also a symbol of consciousness and taking certain forms of gold as food will actually help your brain function. Um, there's a lot of depth to these metaphors, uh, but if my words did glow with the gold of sunshine and my tunes were played on the harp unstrung, would you hear my voice come through the music? Would you hold it near as it were your own? Um, I can't be 100% sure, but that sounds just like the Lucifer myth. Um, and so you look, they look around the world and they see bits and pieces of, you know, how certain things have come together and the ubiquitousness of certain ideas. And they say, oh, yeah, that's proof that there are these Luciferians engineering. What if it's proof of a higher intelligence engineering things? It's just very strange to me that religious people have a tendency to attribute Everything that happens on this plane of existence to the devil, they give their own God almost no power over anything. And every time they see something that seems supernatural or too coincidental uh, to have been a coincidence, they attribute it to humans engineering through conspiracy rather than some sort of intelligence that is guiding the processes um, here on earth. And so, you know, I don't just think I know that one of the reasons that, you know, the sixth sense, another uh, element of the Lucifer story with 666, six is also a solar number. It's Typhoret, which happens to land on the solar plexus. That's one of those coincidences of that order um, that's, you know, th that was not engineered intentionally. Um, subconscious, well, you know what I mean. Uh, also, yes, odd, right? The other Sephiroth, the number nine, the lunar, um, the number nine has so many relationships to the actual physical moon in terms of its size, its distance from the earth, its weight, everything about it adds up to, to nine. And there's no way in hell that the ancient Hebrews that created the, the Kabbalistic tree of life possibly could have known that. Unless, you know, you want to posit some alien contact or something. And then so six, this number of light, the number of man um, uh, that happens to land in the solar plexus. 
Uh, another, I'm going to give you a hint here. I'm not going to show you exactly. Um, you'll have to work this one out yourself. But if you want to see something really extraordinary, it'll absolutely blow your mind if you can figure it out. That symbol of Lucifer, the sigil of Lucifer from the thumbnail, if you uh, can understand its relationship to the sun, um, and I'll, I'll give you a hint that you need uh, a map of the universe, of the solar system, basically. Once you see this, it will absolutely blow your mind because it is not something that could have been contrived at the time. Uh, it's, it's, you'll have to see it yourself. Um, it's not that hard to figure out, but, uh, it's, you know, so what I'm saying basically is that the demonization of the occult, which by the way, the word just means hidden, uh, by these religious systems. In fact, I was talking to a Jewish relative, uh, a step relative, and I was kind of trying to find some common ground because he's like a right wing Republican conservative kind of type. And, uh, so I thought that my study of, of Hebrew mysticism of Jewish mysticism would get me some brownie points. And as soon as I started talking about it, he's like, don't say another word. We're not allowed to even hear about this stuff. It's only for the rabbis. And so that, that just blew my mind, you know, that here are the Jews with a, 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 a mysticism that is so advanced that it's used by, you know, the Western mysteries, occult practitioners, uh, you know, Hebrew is used a lot in, in ritual work. Um, and Jewish people are forbidden from learning their own. That is why you are, should be Jewish. You know what I mean? Because you have this heritage of this tremendously powerful mystical occult tools, and they're actually not allowed to even discuss it except for the rabbis. And so, you know, as is the case with Christianity, where they, they told them that it's, you know, it's cursed, your sixth sense uh, emanating from your pineal gland, which, by the way, has the kind of relationship with electromagnetic frequencies that I, I, I expected it to. That was a really, uh, really great discovery. Um, I'm going to redo that video, too, by the way. Keep your eyes out for the pineal secrets, pine secrets of the pineal gland. Um, but so what I'm saying is that they have all been discouraged from observing uh, the handiwork of their God. Uh, and when they do see it, it freaks them out because they, they, you know what I mean? They associate it with Lucifer and the devil and all of this dark and evil stuff, or they, they attribute it to conspiracy. If it's something that's happening on a, on a global level. So it, it really is incredible how they have sort of reverse engineered these spiritual systems so they actually stop people from attaining to genuine spirituality. Uh, and, you know, to me, I think that this is why Lucifer had became such a um, convenient symbol of, you know, anything that runs against this homogenization uh, the, um, you know, pacification, is that the right word to, to make people pacifists and, and, and zombies, you know, I mean, I'm actually going to have to stop doing this channel, uh, next week because I got tired of not fitting in with the rest of my, uh, American citizens. So I've scheduled myself for frontal lobotomy, um, so that I can have more friends, um, <laughs> and that's mostly necessitated that frontal lobotomy by the existence of, of, of Christianity um, and other religions in other parts of the world. But where I live, um, it's, it's, or where I lived, well, here in South America as well, people have been totally cut off from their ancestral roots uh, from ayahuasca and San Pedro and shamanism and nature. And uh, a lot of them are just now reconnecting uh, with that as these things become popular again. Um, but, you know, a lot of them are embarrassed a lot of the mestizos here, which is what we call, um, like, I don't want to say half breeds. It sounds rude, but you know, people of Spanish and indigenous, um, descent, uh, because the Catholic church convinced them that their practices were, uh, evil. And, uh, I've still heard, um, recently stories of people being sacrificed, basically murdered, uh, for being shaman in places like Guatemala uh, and, and Mexico, um, you have to be very, I was almost killed. Um, uh, and 
by flat earthers um, for winning a debate. Uh, the guy that was doing the threatening was a um, ex Navy SEAL and a mercenary, so he flies around the planet killing people under contract. And um, he he kept leaning leaning over and whispering something, and I was kind of ignoring him because I was trying to debate the guy. But he, eventually, I figured out he was threatening me, and then later I found out he had been threatening my supporters that had come, including a, like a ninety year old lady. Um, nice, Rebecca. Uh, be safe. Don't overdo it. Just remember that with plant medicine that um, you can't undrink it. So, uh, you know, take it easy. And remember that it lasts a really long time. So I don't know how much power you have over the ceremony, but you want to start early if you can. Uh, and it might not save you still. I've been awake for as long as like, you know, 30 or 40 hours. Um after having consumed, uh, also drink lots and lots of water. Uh, you can get very dehydrated. Um, so I feel like I'm missing some super important stuff. Um, but you know, I would have my computer with things kind of organized so that I had some idea, uh, where I was at with, with things and crap and stuff. So, oh, I figured that the Jesus people would show up. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it's what when I, earlier I referenced that um, there are things in the Bible that only initiates would understand. It's it's so funny too that it's Jesus thing like. Yoshua is actually what it would say in Aramaic or in Hebrew, Yeshua. Uh, it's not even a name of a person. It just means savior. It's just, it's just, it's like they're saying the savior said. Uh, so Jesus wouldn't have been his name. Yoshua wouldn't have been his name. This was just, oh, right. We were going to talk about Satan a little bit. Uh, because a lot of people associate um, Lucifer with Satan. And nowhere in the Bible is there any kind of, that's not a thing. Lucifer is only mentioned twice, and I think Satan is only mentioned twice. And Satan is actually acting as a servant of God. He's supposed to be, uh, you know, the adversary, which is actually what uh, Hasetan means in Hebrew. It's the as adversary or the stumbling block. And so um, it was a title that if you actually read the Bible in the original Hebrew, it's used like for four different people or something, King David being one of them. Um uh, it's, it's not an, it's not an angel. It's not an individual. It's, it's, that's not even, it's just so crazy. That these Christians and people that believe that they should believe the Bible to the letter don't know it a fragment as well as I do. And I, you know, and I, and I think it's garbage. How did that happen? You know, um, <laughs> It's not actually that it's garbage. It, it, what they did is they took deep, profound truths and they cloaked them with a bunch of bullshit and lies because you don't need a savior, dude. Um, the light barrier, it's the light bearer, dude. You don't need a savior. No one's going to save you. Jesus isn't real. Jesus has never been real. There was no physical person that walked the earth. Um, you know, I said this in the last live stream, but I'll say it again. Uh, there is not one shred of evidence anywhere in the world um, that Jesus uh, actually, well, you know who else calls himself Morning Star? Jesus. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the book of Exodus, or Ezekiel, Ezekiel, yeah, Ezekiel, uh, they say, how hast thou fallen from heaven, O bright and shining morning star? Which isn't actually what the Hebrew says. Uh, it says Ben Hillel. Uh, not Lucifer, um, and it's not even a translation, but moving on. Uh, at the end of the book, Jesus says, I am the bright and shining morning star. So explain to me how it is that, um, okay, well, then why does Jesus say, I am the bright and shining morning star in the book of Revelation? They were trying to tell you. It's like the Bible is written as a sort of... Um, uh, they're clowning on the common man. You know, they're like, these idiots don't even realize. Yes, he does say that. He absolutely says that in the book of Revelation. Um, 
Google it right now. All you have to do is type in, I am the bright and shining morning star, and you will get Revelation 11, 19 or something. 100%. You see? See? You don't even, I just told you what to do, dude. You don't, you don't even know the Bible a fraction as well as I do. I, I, you know, I, I know the Bible in all of the original languages, basically. And you're here telling me shit? Like, what are you thinking? You know what I mean? Don't speak about things of which you don't have any actual knowledge. That's not, that's not, you know, it's not good for you and it's not good for anyone else. Yeah, you know, I mean, religious, the religious people are generally operating on about half a brain cell, I guess. But uh, uh, maybe not your intellectual. That's not even a sentence. It's too bad I don't have my laptop. This has been happening almost every live stream. A Christian jumps in and they start running their mouth. The last guy was a little better than this one. Um, but so, okay, so Satan, all right? So this guy is arguing about how Revelation 22, 16. Thank you. So Christian jumps in here and tells me that's not even in the Bible. Why do I know the Bible better than you and I'm not even Christian? Like, what kind of sense does that make? If you're going to devote your life to a belief system, you'd think you would actually know what it is, where it came from. Um, there you go. Show me, bro. There it is right in front of your face, dude. He just put it in the chat. And Peter 119. Okay, well, that's pretty sweet. So, okay, but let's talk about Satan for a second. Um, not only the fact that Satan, if you're going to really be a to-the-letter Christian, um, Satan is not a person. It's, it's not an angel. It's not a being. It's just a title that means adversary, stumbling block, and there's a third, I, I don't know the other Hebrew uh, translation of it. Hebrew is a crazy language, by the way. Um, but let's look at what Satan actually does in the Bible. Uh, Jesus is suffering. He's putting himself through hell. He's not eating. He's roaming around in the desert. He hasn't drank water in 40 days. And Satan is like, dude, go get some food. Like you're a smart guy. You have charisma, you know, you just go get some water and food. You don't have to do this to yourself. You know, what are you doing out here in the desert? Oh no, how evil. Okay, and then the next time Satan appears in the Bible, what is he doing? He's minding his own damn business, walking around, right? And God, Jehovah, Tetragrammaton, Yahweh, whatever you want to call it, Satan, the real Satan, right? The demiorgos, the false God that thinks he's God, comes down and he says, Satan, what are you doing? And Satan says, I'm, Lord, I'm walking to and fro upon the earth, right? Walking to and fro and to and fro and to and fro is actually exactly what he says. Uh, and so God says, well, you know, Job, he's totally dedicated and devoted and, um, well, go kill his whole family and torture him and see if he still loves me. And Satan's like, what? Are you sure? And God's like, yeah. And Satan's like, okay, fucking psychopath. And he goes and does it. Right. And he comes back and he's like, okay, Lord, he's still totally devoted. And I mean, a guy is a fucking simp and God's like, okay, well, that's not good enough. Go kill all the rest of his family and give him leprosy and burn his house down and just totally fucking destroy everything. And Satan's like, what? Okay. And he goes and does as he's told. So, uh, I don't know what crater earth even is. I, I've, <laughs> I've never, I've never even heard of it. But the point is that, you know, the only time that Satan ever does anything in the Bible, he's either trying to talk some sense into Jesus or he's doing the evil ass bidding of his father who ain't in heaven. Here is maybe the best, best possible explanation or the best evidence. Dude, quoting the Bible is not, what is that? What, is, what does that even mean? It's words from a book. Um, the best, the best evidence though, that Christians are actually worshiping an evil God by their own definition of what evil is, Right. They say that Satanists are evil because they blood sacrifice the innocents, right? These motherfuckers have apparently never read the New Testament because uh, this God that they worship does to his own son the thing that they claim makes Satanists the epitome of evil. So they say that Satanists are evil because they're sacrificing blood sacrificing innocents. And then they worship a God that did the same thing, that did that very thing. Like, and they don't even notice. They don't even notice. I made a TikTok 
uh, where I explained that. And there were Christians actually that cr it cracked them in the comments. They're like, I can't unhear this. <laughs> it's true. You know, free yourself, man. You can actually have like real spiritual experience and not be afraid of it. If you just let go of the dogmatic bullshit fairy tale, I mean, you're believing a bronze age myth. Like it's, it's, the, it's from the same time period as like Zeus and Athena and all of this stuff, you know? Um, well, that's too bad, man, because you're delusional. It's, it's not real. It's, it's definitely not real. Jesus never lived. Jesus is a composite myth. Uh, it, it's, he is constructed from the, uh, the, the rubble heap of older myths. And then his entire campaign is based on the military campaign of Titus. It's, the Romans, they, they dug up the papers where they were planning to create the religion and why. There's no argument at this point as to whether or not there was ever a Jesus anywhere that actually lived. We found 200, 200 million year old dinosaur bones and not one shred of evidence of the, any of the people in the Bible ever lived. So... Um, a brief and rather unpleasant history of human horns. <laughs> yeah, you know, so Satan, not real, not even meant to be, you know, that's, that's the craziest thing about, about these to the letter interpretations. They're not to the letter. The, the people that, that are espousing this Christian crap don't even know what the book says, not even close, right? I mean, the serpent, you know, I, I've, I've, I've talked about this. Um, the people in the Bible were the dinosaur fossils we found. Um, we talk about. Uh, what? Um, that, that totally made me lose my train of thought. Just trying to figure out what the fuck he's talking about. Yeah, man, of course they're pagan beliefs. The whole thing is pagan. Uh, all they did was, was was rename the holidays, the solstices, and, uh, you know, Easter is Ishtar, uh, and the bunny and the eggs come from the fertility rites of Ishtar. Uh, it's, it's, it's all drawn from the blood sacrifice of, of the innocent, um, of Jesus, uh, the, the scapegoat idea, which is another reason why I think it's very unhealthy to believe in negative entities. I don't actually believe in them. Um, the, the old practice of constraining demons to the service of the magician was about uh, constraining your vices and your weaknesses, your delusions into your service, um, because you will find that you can't necessarily change everything, but you can change how you relate to things. And so... You know, that's the real, um, you know, the, the, these demons and, 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 and negative entities that people love to believe in. It just gives them a way to give their power away. It allows them to go out and do evil or at least stupid things and be weak and, and blame it on some kind of spiritual entity that has attached themselves to them. And you know what the best evidence for this is? Only countries that have problems with those type of entities and require exorcisms are places where people believe in demons. It just doesn't happen where people don't believe in it, period. And down here in South America, where we have people who drink ayahuasca, and they, uh, you know, they know more about the spirit realm, in my opinion, than anyone else, because what ayahuasca basically does is just take the filters off of your consciousness and it puts you in the ultimate reality. That's what it's for. That's how it's used. That's what it does, right? A lot of these tribes don't even have language for negative spiritual entities. Uh, they just don't exist. Um, they're, they're, it's just not a thing. And so, you know, the, but this idea of scapegoating even also comes from older religions, the demonization of the horned God. This goes back to Hermes and Thoth. And, oh, this is super important. And I'm glad. I just remember I was like, man, I'm forgetting something really important. I don't have my computer to keep me on track. I just remembered what it was. Hermetic teachings, right? The secret doctrine. Um, this stuff has a lot of different names. 
But what it is basically is like the truth without any dogma, without fairy tales. It is just like observation of natural process, of energetic process, and elucidation on that. And then, you know, how to implement uh, an understanding of the deeper workings, the underpinnings, the wiring under the board of the universe, how to relate to it, and how to use it to your benefit, right? And without any dogma, no scriptural fucking whatever, just just the bare bones truth, right? The Kabbalion, you know, talks about it, but Hermes, uh, Trismegistus, um, the Thoth, uh, and even the corollaries to those entities in Africa that do the same stuff, they were depicted as horn gods at the crossroads, uh, and they presided over um, the same uh, stuff. So music, number, uh, numerology, occult, magic, um, writing. Uh, and so the demonization of the, that image behind me, and that's why it's there. It's not because I actually worship the devil and like evil stuff. I just think Baph Baphomet was an attempt at reclaiming that power. And, you know, it's a glyph of nature, of virility, of, you know, lust and strength and, um, and self mastery and, you know, real spiritual power and understanding that the universe is an interplay of antinomies, Yakin and Boaz, the two pillars, you know, of which uh, Baphomet is playing the role of the third uh, in the center there. But the demonization of Hermes uh, as the progenitor of the mysteries uh, is, I think, the motivation for creating the goat, demon, uh, Lucifer, Satan creature right? Because they wanted to do everything within their power to discourage people from finding the secret doctrine, because it's easy for anyone to understand. Um, it's it, And it's extremely empowering, and it's extremely liberating. And a person that has had real gnosis is not governable, and they don't need to be governed. They're generally not a threat to anyone, right? And it's not because they're trying to adhere to some religious dogma. It's because they have undergone an internal process that has actually changed them. Well, I'm just trying to help you, man. You know, I don't think it's good to be trapped in a Stone Age myth and to believe things that aren't true. Uh, you know, it's... Um, in fact, I know it's not. If you look at the damage that Christianity has done over the centuries, it is extraordinary. We've lost entire cultures. People have been tortured to death. Uh, you know, science was set back 250 years, uh, you know, and it goes on to this day. Um, it is it is oppressive uh, and it is it's it's anti spiritual. You know, Christianity actually precludes, as I've been saying over and over again, <laughs> precludes actual spiritual experience. It occults uh, the uh, wondrous workings of, you know, the universal mind uh, and makes the people uh, that believe in, in these uh, anti-superstition sort of, uh, well, not anti-superstition, but, you know, that, that they, they see supernatural things and think it's an evil working of the devil. Um, so if, if they do happen to encounter a true miraculous manifestation from another world, they're going to be scared of it. They're not going to embrace it. They're not going to learn from it. They're not going to integrate it. They're going to fucking dig and put their head in the, in the sand. Well, and see that dying for your faith thing is the exact lunacy that is killing the entire human race. Um, you know, only the madman is absolutely certain. And so, you know, if you have any kind of dogmatic certainty, uh, you, might want to consider checking yourself in to some kind of um, psychological rehabilitation center. <laughs> you know, if you're religious, get some help. There is help. Um, and the thing is, you can have a spiritual existence without being religious. You don't need a book. You don't need a savior. You don't need a teacher even. All, the only teacher is experience anyways. And so what you need is to engage in practices that catalyze internal processes that result in transformation and transmutation of lead into gold, right? You have to alchemize your own spirit. Um, and just asking some random sky god to just do that for you is just dumb and lazy and insane and impractical and unpragmatic and you know, it's, and it's a fucking fairy tale. It's not how it works. You know, you take responsibility for your own divinity and you realize, 
that divinity through actualization um, of, of, of metaphysical concept and, and philosophical uh, learnings. Uh, well, I mean, what you're saying is in your DNA, what, you're, what that really means is that you've been indoctrinated and programmed uh, for generations and generations, but it doesn't make it real. Uh, another really, if you want your mind blown super hard, uh, and this idea also that that immaterial spark created all of the universe, right? Uh, maybe 15 years ago, I think, maybe more recently, I think it was 2013, um, the, uh, the, the Pope gave a speech at the Vatican and it's all transcribed. I believe the video is on YouTube if you happen to speak Italian. Actually, I'm positive of it. I checked. Um, deep tissue programming? Uh, I'm not sure if I know what you mean. Um, the Pope actually, actually referred to Lucifer as the father of Jesus in a speech at the Vatican for like 80,000 people. And the craziest thing about it was that nobody blinked. Like you would think there'd be a gasp in the audience. Like, Oh my God, can you believe this motherfucker just said that? And, um, that's, they're just, they're just like, bat, 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 you know, it's, it's insane. Um, like I said, you know, I mean, you'll say you'll die for your faith, but you're arguing with me about the words of your Savior. I knew them better than you did. What does that say about? No, I haven't seen the snake room, but what I can say about the Pope at the synagogue of Satan um, is that they, the, 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 the Pope's throne is solid gold. Um, and so, you know, sitting in that solid gold throne and... Um, talking about feeding the world and stuff. I mean, it's just the most ridiculous thing ever in the history of the world. Uh, if there is any such thing as evil, I think the, the Vatican and the Catholic church pretty much own that shit. Um, so Satan, not a real angel. Lucifer, also just a modality of consciousness. Um, but what I was saying about Hermes and, and the secret doctrine and the demonization of all that uh, is, you know, this is the real underlying cause of the, uh, of the ubiquitousness of this stuff and why Christians see the devil in all of it. One of the, um, one of the craziest experiences that I've had around all this stuff, let's see if I can do it right now. Nope, fail. Oh, I didn't say it out loud. Uh, so this book here, the Kabbalion, um, I'm going to do a multi-part uh, entire reading with commentary on the Kabbalion uh, as soon as I get my computer back. And so, um, and this does tie back into the Lucifer thing. So just bear with me for a moment. Uh, I was reading a list of Aleister Crowley's suggested reading. Um, for his students in the AA, his, his secret society. And I saw the Kabbalion on, on the list and someone had told me I should read it and it caught my attention. And I said um, out loud to my girlfriend, we're getting ready to leave to go to the coast, which is the town of Mendocino, which is a town of only 300 people uh, at peak season. So there's not a lot of people there and that's important to the story, right? There's hardly anyone there. Um, and so we, uh, we go out there the next day and we go into this little used bookstore and she pulls this copy of this book off the shelf. And she's like, isn't this the, the book you're looking for? And it's an 81 year old copy in mint condition. I mean, it looks like it has never been like used. It's 81 years old. It's like a first edition. It was like, Oh, it was 15 bucks. Um, actually kind of mad that he wrote in it. Uh, yeah, AA student list. Um, yeah, somebody in a in a in a Thelema group the other day, I posted the the link to my live stream about this, and uh, he um, he said, "Oh, this is off subject," and I'm like, "It's suggested reading from." Cor but anyways, okay, so here's what happened. I had noticed that this this I'd started to figure out what Luciferianism really was, and I had noticed that there were you know. Uh, hints of the myth, I guess, 
and the lyrics of the Grateful Dead and all of the bands everywhere, all of them studied Aleister Crowley. And, uh, you know, I was really starting to figure out that there was something to this and that it wasn't just, you know, a meaningless part of this shitty old self-help book uh, called the Bible. Um, and so I was thinking about it a lot, trying to get to the root of it all. And, uh, so I get this book under these really weird circumstances. And I, when you open it up, one of the first things that it says is that if you have this book in your hand, it probably came to you under weird circumstances and it's because it's time and all this stuff. And, and so I'm like, wow, that's weird. I mean, I was like looking around over my shoulder, like, where are the secret society guys following me around and planting stuff? You know what I mean? Cause it was just so goddamn weird. I, the day before I had said, you know, I want to find this book and then we find it in a tiny little remote town in the middle of nowhere in a tiny little used bookstore that has like 70 books or something in the entire building. Uh, it was, it was weird. So we get to the hotel and, uh, we drop acid and, um, Oh, I did it. I did it. Ha. Where is it? You guys see the name Lucifer somewhere in there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's weird. It's backwards when I hold it up. Uh, but anyways, so, so what happened is I said, um, so what does Lucifer have to do with all this? And I grabbed the Kabbalion and I flipped it open and I'm looking at the name Lucifer and I'm like, wow, you know, what the fuck was that? And, uh, so I read what I'm looking at. My girlfriend has just watched this. Jesus put it there for you. <laughs> right. So my girlfriend has just watched this. Like I, I flip it open and, and I, I read it and then I turn it around and she runs to the bathroom and vomits, you know, cause it was, and then later I checked and it's the only time that Lucifer is mentioned in the 175 pages or 200 pages or whatever it is. Yeah. It's over 200, 241 pages. It's the only time that Lucifer is ever mentioned in the, in the book. So, um, and what it says is that Lucifer and, and, and Beelzebub and all of these fallen angels have some reality to them as any good occultist knows. And so, you know, I think, again, that's a reference to the fact that what these words actually represent are like archetypal forms of consciousness or modalities of consciousness, frequencies of consciousness, uh, you know, similar to the Jungian archetypes. So, um for now, I think that's all I have to say about that. For my patrons, I am doing a reading of the beginning of uh, Morals and Dogma. Uh, we're going to uh, unravel some Masonic secrets. So if you're not a patron, consider becoming a patron. Uh, please do hit the like button, share, subscribe. And if you want to support us and keep this content coming, there are ways to do so in the description. Every possible way that you could um, ask for. And also, if you have any questions or anything else you'd like me to talk about while I'm here, um, my computer's in the shop, my partner's asleep, so I have nothing to do, actually, really. <laughs> uh, would you consider Lucifer, an, I don't even know, I've never heard that term before, um, but as I was saying, I, I think that, uh, you know, Lucifer is not like a person or an angel or an alien or anything like that. Um, although uh, this is something I'm going to get into when I talk about the Kabbalion, um, it has come to me from a number of reputable sources, including uh, indigenous people that could call the wind and whatnot. Um, and from my experiences uh, as an initiate, um, there are people that think that Thoth was not, a human, uh, that it was either an interdimensional or, uh, an actual space alien. Um, and I, I know that there are books to that effect and, um, you know, my, my own inner working and some of the things that I have read and experienced, uh, it's too much to go into in this space, but I, I really wouldn't consider that out of the question. And the idea was that he appeared here sometime around the, you know, Babylonian kings which is by the way uh one of the suspected origins of the name lucifer that it was a proper title for the babylonian king of the time and uh it's interesting that here we are in the current period with the most evil empire uh no well no um and and it's babylon you know is what the rastas call the white man's well not the white man it's asians too really that have caused it but 
you know what I'm talking about. Like modern civilization is Babylon and it is kind of like this evil Luciferian kingdom. Um, except that I don't believe that Lucifer is evil. You know what I mean? Uh, macroscopic equivalency to microscopic aspects of consciousness. Well, of course, the whole thing is holographic. Um, the, yeah. Um, okay. So I can't see the chat after you guys write. It just disappears on the phone. It's just gone. Like it comes up for a second. So it's hard for me to keep track if there's a lot of questions. Um, but okay. So I don't think it's a thought form. I think that it's the original thought. What we're actually referencing when we say Lucifer, uh, could it also be thought form? Sure. I mean, I, I, you know, DMT is a crazy ass thing and the things that I've encountered and experienced, experienced in that realm um it what it appears to be to me is that it's like consciousness in a certain density where it's almost material but not quite um and you know there is also like uh, mcgregor mathers talked about how his wife also claimed to see this thought form that mathers had created he sent it to crowley crowley made it nastier and sent it back like why are you going to try to start a magical war with alistair crowley who the fuck did he think he was he thought he had jesus on his side oops um and so the thing killed him it was the story that it had this proboscis kind of thing and it would suck his etheric field and just slowly drained his life force and uh, his wife said it would try to cuddle up to them like a cat and that it was pale and had like these like f gross shoulders that were real fat and its head was kind of man, like a proboscis. Um, I, I've, I've seen people that look like this thing on TikTok. <laughs> um, so no, I think that when we're speaking of Lucifer, we're talking about the immaterial spark, the thing that moved against the nothingness, uh, the, the process that is guided by consciousness um, so Lucifer's creation basically, right? Uh, I mean, I don't know when you got into the live stream and if you missed the stuff in the beginning, but anybody that came in, you know, later, I would strongly suggest that you go back and check out the first half because, um, you know, I, 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 <clears throat> I think I did a pretty good job of, of explaining the, the, the deep mysticism, um, that this stuff is reflective of, but no, I, I think that it's, it's not a, a, human creation necessarily it's consciousness in like a raw form um and then i saw somebody asking about sun worship and i think that you know as terence mckenna said the truth if the truth could be told if the truth could be told so as to be understood it would be believed right because we all have access to these fundamental truths um it one element of this that is you know true on a material level is the uh, ancestral memory. Uh, geneticists have proven that it's not just that DNA retains some record of behavior, behavioral patterns from you know the past and, and retains certain characteristics or whatever. We literally are carrying the memories of our ancestors with us. Um, And so it's like, how far does that go back? And according to like, you know, Timothy Leary back in the 1960s, you know, he was saying that we can actually remember all the way back to the big bang. And even before that, the memory is in every single um, cell in our bodies. And there are physicists now that say the same thing about the zero point field, that there is a record of all energetic exchanges of any kind that have ever occurred, uh, that they're all permanent. Um, and since they're in the nature of vibration, uh, you know, it makes sense that they would just be emanating throughout space for all of eternity. Um, and so, because we know, right, uh, as I was explaining earlier, that I think that what consciousness really is, what a, a human being and our consciousness is, right, we're really just energy. We're just fields that have overlapped. And human consciousness is a density of electromagnetic waves and vectors of the four fields of um, vectors of, of con convergence uh, of the four fields of physics. And that when that happens at a certain density, uh, it creates a fifth, the, the quintessence, right? Consciousness. Um, and so if you consider like what a sun is, you want to talk about vectors of convergence of EMFs and the fields of physics, right? That's as dense as it can get, maybe outside of a black hole, right? 
So that is where our consciousness is emanating from. And it makes sense that if this is correct, and it absolutely seems to be, right? Our pineal gland emanates EMFs. Um, our brain is full of magnetite, like full of magnetite. So this idea that consciousness is uh, has as its mechanistic uh, basis uh, EMFs, uh, you know, that's why we're, our brains are loaded with uh, magnetite. I've been interested to research and see with animals of lower orders of consciousness, how much magnetite is in their brain and see if there's a correlation between higher consciousness and uh, the amount of magnetite. But what I'm saying about the sun, obviously, is that it's a huge emanation of consciousness if this idea is correct. And I think it has to be. I mean, we know consciousness doesn't come from the brain, by the way. That's absolutely been proven uh, beyond a, a fraction of a doubt. And there are two things um, that have uh, really, really made that obvious. One of, one of them, three of them actually, but they, two of them involve fungus. So I almost call them one. Uh, mycelium has been proven to be conscious. Uh, Paul Stamets did a bunch of experiments or commissioned scientists to do a bunch of experiments uh, on mycelium. And they determined that not only is it intelligent, um, but it's, it's conscious. And so, um, slime molds in Japan have proven to be more intelligent than humans. This is a single cell organism, right? It's a slime mold. It's like nothing. It's like, it's like Gaia and snot or something. And so what they did is they put, um, uh, more food in larger population centers on a map. And then they put the slime mold uh, and the slime mold came up with a better transportation system than the world's best engineers using the world's best computers. The slime molds transportation system was better than the one that humans created. So you, there's no fucking brain in a slime mold. There's no equivalent of a brain. There's nothing but a single cell. So, um, not coming from the brain, but here's an even more powerful one. And I know that I reference this a lot, but I think that it's hard for us to really wrap our heads around it and to give it enough credit, the weight that it really has, because you have to remember that our entire scientific ontology that defines the modern era is basically uh, rooted in the idea that the brain produces electricity that gives us consciousness. And that's it. Um, and this event or discovery totally proves that that's not the case. Uh, and it's a condition where people are born with no brain. They might have a little sack at the end of their spinal cord, uh, but they have no brain. And usually they are mentally disabled. Um, but in at least one case, the guy was a doctor. He had a headache. He went to get a brain scan. He had no brain. So this idea that consciousness is coming from us, coming to us, uh, from somewhere other than the brain is an absolute certainty at this point. The brain has some role, obviously, like a receiver or a translator, transducer. I don't know exactly, but it definitely is not the source of our consciousness. And if it was me, I would probably, you know, the sun. And so sun worship, I think, is this intuition uh, that people have, because we all kind of know it, that the light, that the sun, that gives everything life. Um, but, you know, I don't think it's this really simple, uh, you know, modern man is really arrogant. And it really looks down on uh, primitive cultures, obviously, right? And I think a lot of it is just a really tragic... Um, a really tragic uh, breakdown of communication, right? So the the indigenous person in the 1600s said, the rock is alive. What he actually meant was the rock is conscious to a degree, but he doesn't have the language uh, to, to communicate it in the way that the white man's going to understand. He doesn't even understand why the white man doesn't know these things, right? Because the only difference is that the indigenous person hasn't been indoctrinated into a false belief system that had occulted this reality that really anyone that takes their blinders off, uh, that escapes the mind forged manacles, uh, anyone uh, that does that sees all of this. You know, it's not it's not it's not really even that big of an accomplishment. 
you know, and it's something we need to stop doing. Don't people that figure this stuff out, don't put them on a pedestal. Uh, it should be normal, <laughs> right? It should be just like an average common thing. Um, Yeah, well, that kid only lived with only a brain stem, but he actually is developing more cognitive abilities than they ex expected. Um, but there, there were, there's at least three cases uh, where the person was fully functional and one of them was a doctor. I had trouble finding the article, but I did find it um, a little while back. Somebody posted a TikTok that actually had pictures of the doctor and stuff. Um, and I originally read about it in Scientific American, which is not exactly known for, you know, tabloid level journalism it's you know it's all solid stuff in scientific american um but so yeah i mean that's what sun worship is about that's where our consciousness comes from and some part of us knows it and uh you know the whole solar myth it's it's also the reason why they made jesus uh they modeled him on the sun right because we know the truth deep down inside so if they uh, offer us something that is the truth cloaked in some bullshit. People sense the truth that's right under the surface, right? And so they believe in it. That's why they believe in it so wholeheartedly. You know, like that guy earlier was like, I'll die for my Christian faith and blah, blah, blah. He knows it's true. But what he doesn't understand is that it's, it's metaphysical truths that have been buried in a myth that is complete nonsense, you know? And beyond that, it's like the, the version of Christianity that most people uh, believe in the United States and Europe is not even really what's in the book. It's an oral tradition that has developed from the pulpit. You know, like, for example, the snake telling the truth in the Garden of Eden. The serpent said, uh, you know, eat of eat of the tree of life and verily thou shalt not die. And Jehovah threatened them with death if they didn't stay in ignorance. Right. That's that's God. That's a positive influence. This is what you're going to worship the thing that threatened them with death. If they became more intelligent and, and got more knowledge that. And so the serpent comes along and says, you know, verily thou shalt not die. And what happened when they ate of the fruit? They didn't die. And they knew the serpent told the truth. But the priester gets up in the pulpit and tells people the opposite of what actually happened in the book. And they just buy, buy, because, you know, realistically, most of those people can't even read it. You know what I mean? Like most, especially these days, uh, your average United States citizen in the Bible Belt can barely write their name, much less read some old English, uh, you know, it's just way beyond them. So they, and they don't really have an interest in it. Um, you know, I, I hate to be redundant. But in the last couple of live streams, I've mentioned this uh, experiment that was done where there were four people that were in on it and one person that's not. And the one person that's not would lie to conform to whatever the herd uh, said, right? So in large part, uh, people that are m members of these religions, um, members of these religions don't necessarily actually believe in it. They're just pretending to. Uh, because they seek validation through herd conformity. Um, they're sheep, you know. Uh, it's it's written large, the writing's on the wall with all this stuff. It's it's not really hidden. It's right in your face, you know, and, and, and it's incredibly easy to see. And I think that's part of where the horror comes from when you wake up and you realize, uh, you know, what's really going on with all this stuff. The, the obviousness of it, um, and then you kind of realize how dangerous humanity is and how things like Nazi Germany happen uh, and, and how people in the United States are being so easily manipulated. Um, they're, you know, 90 percent of their behavior is subconscious and they have been totally indoctrinated, brainwashed, dumbed down through shitty education. And they will lie about even their actual perceptions in order to conform with the hurt around them. I mean, this is. Uh, so he was asking about portals and, um, soulless humans. Uh, you know, I, I have experienced, and this, this is something I meant to talk about a long time ago, but even though I say that I don't really view Lucifer or any of these beings as having their own objective existence, it's not that I don't think that it's possible. 
that they um, that there is some way that the universal mind communicates with us uh, in the form of voices in our heads. And it's a very, very dangerous thing um, to let into your life uh, because, you know, without really proper training and good critical thinking skills and the proper amount of skepticism, uh, it's very easy to lose the ability to distinguish between, you know, real intuition and just your own wishes and wish demons and delusions and all this kind of thing. And this is why, you know, the occult is legitimately dangerous. Um, it's, it's not that it's evil. It's just that, you know, if you don't know what you're doing and you don't have a certain level of intelligence and a certain level of skill, you really can get yourself in an awful lot of trouble. Um, simply because it is real. Uh, these capacities of consciousness that we are, you know, that are sort of um, denied in our, our in our culture and in our society, um, but they're they're not they're not totally unreal. And I have received information a number of times. Yeah, I eat meat um, a number of times uh, from voices in my head, basically that actually turned out to be accurate. Uh, and I have been told all sorts of remarkable things that I guess I could have generated in my subconscious. Maybe our subconscious is a lot more intelligent than the, the little fragment of our conscious brain that we're actually using. I mean, I guess it stands to reason. Um, but it doesn't seem like it came from me. And so, you know, as far as like po potentially being like avatars for a greater mind. Uh, and when, when I play music, uh, there have definitely been times when I felt possessed. Uh, and, you know, I'm not the only musician that talks about how there's sort of like this thing, the Grateful Dead called it it because they didn't know what it was that would play the, the musicians like puppets. This is also the goal of like North Indian music. And when this thing enters into musicians, it changes the consciousness of the people in the audience uh, in the exact same way, no matter who it is that's doing the channeling. Right. I have literally watched my hand like I was telling it to go up the neck and do something when I was improvising. And it went the other way down the neck and played something better than I was trying to tell it to consciously. Um, so, you know, I've had a number of experiences that suggest very much that. Uh, uh, that yes, we can be avatars or portals for some kind of consciousness that's preterhuman or preternatural. I don't know what it is. Uh, it seems to generally be good. You know, the influence that it has on people seems to be positive. Um, it seems to break people out of their conditioning in the same way that psychedelics do to be exposed to it. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I, I mean, to, to an extent, uh, it's um, the way Aleister Crowley put it is that you know, you practice a thousand times and or practice a hundred times and it is difficult. Practice a thousand times and it is um, less difficult. Practice a thousand thousand times a thousand thousand and it is no longer thou that doeth it, but it that doeth it through thee. And not until then is that that is done well done. Thus spake Frater Perturabo as he leapt from rock to rock upon the moraine without ever casting his eyes upon the ground. Right. So, um, yeah, that, that, and that's, that's what it's like. And that's why, you know, for musicians, uh, the bands that do this and the musicians that do this, they say that you have to improvise for a really long time in order to get into this trance state where this thing can kind of enter into the mix and, uh, take over, um, and that's why, you know, a lot of people didn't understand, like, why do the Grateful Dead improvise for 30 fucking minutes straight? That's why they're they're trying to um, to create space and to get into this sort of trance where this other can put its two cents into the music. And, you know, it's not until then that what they were doing was well done because they're groping around and fumbling and, you know, but then all of a sudden this thing would come out and it's like this rapturous, life-changing extraordinary magic that is inconceivable uh, that human beings could possibly even do it. Um, and so that's, that's, that's what it was, you know, so if that's what you mean by portal, I mean, I've had people in the audience of, of you know, that shows um, where this happened uh, come up to me afterwards and 
describe this, you know, like when you guys were playing, it's like the audience became telepathic and this portal opened and there's like this information coming through and like, what the fuck, you know, that's what we're trying to do, but you know, we're not singing about it and we have this intention. It's a crazy thing when you have an intent like that and you're trying to do something that weird and crazy and random people come out of the audience and say, Hey, this is what I experienced tonight. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really a remarkable thing and it's definitely a real thing. Um, again, what it is, I like to think of it just as the universal mind as a sort of like almost, it's not exactly that it's neutral, um, because it has activity within it. Right. So you can align yourself with, um, with patterns, uh, that are moving forward and that is positive pro progress, you know, but it's not exactly like an agenda. It's just, it's just generally, um, uh, sort of engineered and moving in a way that creates more possibilities and that supports the life forms and the sentient sentientness, uh, within it. Um, it's just sort of a, a self exploration and creation agenda. You know what I mean? But it's, it's not so specific, I guess, as, uh, I don't think anything of the Travis Scott concert. I think that it was, if you get that many people that don't give a fuck about anyone together in one place, um, you're going to have some serious problems. Uh, you know, you can look throughout the history of concerts and you can find a lot of like overtly satanic, like why aren't those bands killing all kinds of people in the audience? If that's what it's about, how come you don't go to see deicide and everybody dies or something? I mean, um, it's just, it doesn't seem very realistic. Danzig, you know, he was a Satanist. Nobody dies in the audience ever. Uh, and if it had to do with like how big and famous you were, then people would hella have been dying at Metallica concerts, Michael Jackson concerts. And you just don't see that. Um, I think what you have there is a culture of, of, of pointlessness, emptiness, vapidity, uh, you know, materialism. And, um, so they're, they, they just don't give a fuck. And if you get that, you know, a hundred thousand people that don't give a fuck about human life all in one place, what do you think is going to happen? You know what I mean? And I, I realized there were some weird correlations between eight torches and eight deaths or whatever. But if you think about a massive surging crowd like that and, you know, like, okay, we're orchestrating this preconceived number of people to die and eight has nothing to do with anything numerologically, but let's just pick eight. It's just coincidence. You know, coincidence happens. There is a symmetry in throughout the universe that is what gives us order. And uh, sometimes things are just coincidences. And the main reason that I don't really think anything occulty was going on at that concert is that that guy did not strike me as having any kind of mojo at all. Like I know what that feels like and what it sounds like. Like if you go see tool, you can tell there's some weird fucking power coming through that band. That's not normal and is not, um, no, in fact, well, yeah, we'll talk about Satanists in a second. Uh, but you know, you can sense this kind of crazy occult power. I don't think it's negative, but there is some kind of weird mojo going on for sure. And also, um, the grateful dead had it and fish and pink Floyd may, you know what I mean? There are bands that have this like weird, mysterious power and it's like somehow connected to consciousness it's even like i've called it him hypnosis inducing music i mean gnosis gnosis not hypnosis gnosis inducing music uh, what i was thinking is that pink floyd's art company was called hypnosis like h-i-p-g-n-o-s-i-s -S, hypnosis um so yeah, I mean, I just didn't, I didn't sense that from him at all. It was just like this super douchey rapper just being a douche with a bunch of douches in the audience. I mean, it didn't really strike me as like that sinister or, you know, like there was any magic going on. It's just this jackass being a jackass and people dying because they're idiots. I mean, sorry, I don't mean to be so blunt, but it's just kind of the truth, you know? I mean, it's kind of insane to go to a, a concert like that anyways with that many people that you know the culture you know, they don't give a flying fuck about anyone and that many of them fucked up in one place. Um, yeah, you can tell when things have that spark and that motherfucker didn't have shit. There's nothing special about it. Nothing powerful, no occult mojo. Um, so you're asking if Satanists are obsessed with death. No, I would say most Satanists probably try to avoid death at all costs because they don't believe in an afterlife. Um, there are different kinds of Satanists, just as there are different kinds of Luciferians. There are Luciferians that are theistic. And so they believe that Lucifer is actually like a God or an angel and he's hanging around 
you know, making shit happen on some weird plane or something. And, <clears throat> and then there are other types of Luciferians that only uh, are Luciferian in the sense that they believe in rebellion against uh, homogeny and the sovereignty of the individual will. And um, they know that consciousness is, you know, divine and maybe that it has some role uh, that it plays that could be considered preternatural. Uh, but they're not exactly like religious uh, in the way that like Christians are religious. Um, and then so Satanists are the same. Oh, and there are Luciferians that are evil and they're just morons that actually think they need to do evil shit. Uh, but that's actually really uncommon. Um, Christians are a far greater danger to children than uh, Satanists. That's a crazy thing. You know, people are always like, oh, no, Satanists are going to get our children. Your child is like 10,000 times as likely to get abducted uh, raped and murdered by a Christian, someone that says that they're Christian, identifies as Christian, than a Satanist. Um, so I don't know what the fuck people are talking about. But uh, an interesting thing about Anton LaVey and that you know, Church of Satan, if you want to talk about the mainstream Church of Satan, uh, it wasn't even going to be satanic at first. Um, he just was trying to create a sort of ethical atheism. So there were some values... Um, there were some guidelines, you know, we find ourselves on a highway with no dividing lines and very few rules to guide, right? So, um, and so, you know, it was just, just like a philosophy, basically, and it was going to be called humanitarianism. And so the Catholic Church got wind of this, and I guess they have copyrighted or trademarked or something, the, the, the phrase, the term humanitarianism. And so they sued him and just out of malice, because he's like, oh yeah, fuck you Catholic church. He changed the name of humanitarianism to Satanism. So the church of Satan has absolutely nothing to do with believing in an actual uh, literal Satan and doing evil or anything. I mean, the nine satanic commandments are basically like, you know, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law kind of, you know, man is just a four-legged animal and should be regarded as such. Uh, and there's some stuff that I don't know if I really, how I feel about it. You know, like um, if a man smite your cheeks, smite him back with tenfold vengeance. Uh, you know, that might be reasonable. I, I, I don't really know. I mean, it, it's sometimes, here's the reality. You know, I mean, we all like to um, believe that we can create a sort of utopia and that spirituality is all about becoming kind and gentle. But there are some people that if they smite you and you don't smite them out of existence, they're going to come back and smite you all the way smote. You know what I mean? So I don't know that it's necessarily even bad advice to not turn the other cheek. Um, yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of what I mean, I guess, you know. That's, that seems a bit extreme of a reaction, but, uh, you know, to each his own. Um, all right, you guys got anything else? I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit, I think. And my light went out. I have not heard of the gateway process. Um, I don't know what it is. Anything else? Uh, <clears throat> man, I've really been talking because my throat is like... Right on, guys. Yeah, please don't forget to hit the like button. Support us on Patreon, Zelle, Cash App, or Cryptocurrency. In the, uh, oh man, you missed a lot. This is probably one of the better live streams uh, that I've done, I think. Um, fairly focused too, which I was a little, I got one like out of that. Come on, you guys. Um, yeah, okay, sure, yeah. Yep. Um, what was I saying? Something about supporting us? Please do support us. Uh Otherwise, I'll die, and then you're not going to have these live streams anymore. 
because they really they have cut us off from everything at this point here that uh, COVID restrictions and no one coming here. We're just like stuck in the mountains with nothing. Yeah. Cool. David. I mean, I would, I, I would recommend it. I, I, there's, there's some pretty interesting um, deep mysticism. Uh, but the thing is, and this is what the fundamental difference between like Luciferian um, uh, you know, hermetic, um, the idea is sort of like a spiritual science. We place no, re we place no reliance on virgin or pigeon. Our method is science. Our aim is religion. Um, or, you know, I, I, the Kabbalion speaks of hermeticism as a spiritual science, um, versus the, 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 the blind dogmatic doctrinal trip. So, you know, what I was saying about the mysticism earlier in, in the video is that it, it, it is all integrated with science. And this is the basically the number one evil, I guess, of, of religion is, well, and even a lot of spirituality is that there's this idea that spirituality and mysticism or spiritual, spiritual I mean, spirituality and science uh, or mysticism and science are somehow mutually exclusive and they are not. Um, in fact, they dovetail quite nicely. And if they don't dovetail, you may want to revise uh, either your science or your uh, spirituality um, because something is not working. Uh, if you have any kind of accurate observation, um, whether it be metaphysical or physical, uh, it is going to apply to multiple si si systems and probably all systems. Um, so, you know, if you have a spiritual or metaphysical insight or belief and you can't find allegories in the physical world, uh, then you probably have come upon some falsehood. Uh, it should hold water uh, no matter, you know, which way you are, from what vantage point you're observing, it's, it's, it's still functional. So I guess, I guess, I don't know. There's, does anybody have any more questions or anything? I mean, my phone hasn't died yet. There's still people here. Uh, the number of likes that I've gotten in the last couple of streams has been better. The last, the last one on um, authenticity <clears throat> had like 25% of the people that watched it liked it. So that's very helpful. I appreciate the engagement um, I realized also today that if I got only 50 cents a month from every subscriber, the channel would make $2,500 a month. It seems crazy that, you know, 50 cents a subscriber. It's got, speaking of that, uh, you guys, the t-shirts would have been done in time for this live stream and they were perfect. Um, <laughs> they were perfect, uh, uh, perfect designs for this, this subject. Um, no, Masons don't control the world. Jesuits don't control the world. Askenazis don't control the world. They control part of the world. Um, there is absolutely no doubt that Masons are extremely powerful and that they have a lot of influence in a lot of places. Uh, and they don't deny that. Um, when you go to sign up, you know, when I went, they gave me a little business card that uh, you, it's what it says on it. And, you know, turn it over and it says, you know, we are powerful as fuck. And if you are one of our brothers, then you are powerful as fuck too. And there's always, you know, you never have to worry about anything. You and your family are taken care of. Um, you know, as soon as you go and, and have dinner with them, which is the first step, if you don't have a family member, you just have to go to a lodge and, um, and go to one of the free dinners that they have once a week, usually. Uh, and they'll give you a little card. Um, and it says that on it, you know, we're powerful as hell and we got your back if you're one of us. Um, but they're not the only influence and uh, they're not even a single influence because, uh, you know, everything is balanced by its opposite in this universe. And these laws are able to govern things that you would not think like physical stuff and non-physical stuff all play by the same set of rules. It's all energy. And it's, so it's still mechanical in a sense, you know, it still uh, has its deterministic uh, roots. Um, if it's phenomenological, 
uh, you know, it, it has some sort of substantive reality to it. Uh, and so th th this extends almost to like idea. And what I'm saying is that there are two paths uh, within masonry or any mystery school. There's the left-hand path and the right-hand path. And the, the brothers of the left-hand path are totally self-serving. That's their whole trip. At the end of time, they're completely destroyed with nothing left at all. So it's a self-sacrifice too. And all the evil in the world creates all the good. So they're kind of in a weird way like the saviors. Uh, but then there's the, the, the brothers of the, 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 the right-hand path, uh, the white brotherhood. Um, and I know it sounds like a clan reference, but it has nothing to do with that. Um, it just happens to be called the white brotherhood. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, within the world of masonry, there are both left-hand path and, and right-hand path magicians. And if it wasn't for that fact, we would all have been enslaved a long time ago. Um, I, I think that when people worry about the Illuminati and they think about these conspiracies, they don't think about the other side of the coin. If there wasn't something that was interceding on our behalf, uh, the game would have been over a long time ago if that really is the agenda to control everything absolutely. Um, and in my opinion, that's what the Illuminati actually were, uh, was the, the, the thing that actually is um, stopping them from getting their complete and total control that they seem to be intent on. Okay, so, all right, guys, 100 minutes. Uh, please support us, and thank you for spending this time with me. We'll see you uh, next time, I think, is the Kabbalion, unless you're a um, patron, and then we're doing Masonic Secrets.